Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. My guest today is the creator, executive producer, and host of the Sex Ed with DB podcast, a feminist podcast bringing you all the sex ed you never got. Welcome, Danielle Bezalel. Hi, Danielle. How are you? Hello. I'm great. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Um, so to start, I'd love for you to begin by just explaining exactly what you do as a sex educator. Sure. I'd love to. Yeah. So I am, as you said, the creator, executive producer, and host of Sex Ed with DB. And just to share our mission one more time, because I think it's such a good one, uh, we're a feminist podcast and multimedia platform bringing you all the sex ed you never got through unique and entertaining storytelling, centering LGBTQ plus and BIPOC experts. And so we talk a lot on the podcast about all kinds of sex ed topics from birth control to kink and BDSM to abortion to pleasure, healthy relationships, condoms, you name it. And so I've been doing sex ed with DB for six and a half years. Uh, The past two years has been full time, which has been really awesome. And occasionally I teach sex ed for youth in the classroom, whether that be middle school or high school. I'll do age appropriate sex education, uh, medically accurate, comprehensive, super important. We'll get into that, I'm sure, a little bit later in the interview. Uh, And we also uh, run education on social media. So we're on Instagram and TikTok uh, and a couple other platforms where we make comprehensive, uh, easy to digest, funny sex ed content. Now, how did you get into this field? So I went to school originally. I got my bachelor's from UC Berkeley in film and media studies with a minor in education. So I've always been really, really passionate about storytelling and really just, you know, centering people and hearing from them about their lives and experiences. That was really at the core of what I was interested in from the get-go. And then I have like a brief origin story if you're down for me to share that. But I am down. Okay, great. So essentially the year after I graduated from college, I actually taught abroad uh, for a year. I actually went to Israel, very topical, obviously, with all the horrificness going on in the Middle East. Um, but originally, my my dad was born in Afghanistan. We're Afghani Jews. He moved to Israel when he was a teenager in the 70s. And so I have some extended family there and some in, in New York. And so at the time, I wanted to go to Israel, teach English, maybe learn Hebrew and get to know my family a little bit better. And uh, long story short, my teaching cohort went to a field trip on on a day in October in 2014, so almost 10 years ago. And we went to a very religious community in Jerusalem. It was called the Community of the Bells. And this Orthodox rabbi was kind of showing us around and saying, here's my synagogue, here's our customs, here are our traditions in this community. And he kind of offhandedly mentions that he has five daughters. And when they reach the age of 17 or 18, they marry them off by the matchmaker and they don't learn about sex until their wedding night when they have it for the first time. And the community prays that they get pregnant (laughs) from that first time. So in my 21-year-old body, I was, as you could imagine, very heated, very angry. Uh, A brief backstory too, my mom is an OBGYN. So I really grew up with this idea that women's rights and reproductive health were paramount and super important. And so I was the only one who kind of shot up my hand and tried to challenge this man and said like, hey, what about what they want? And what about, you know, if they're not ready to be moms and their consent? And I kind of rattle off a bunch of questions. And he was like, I'm going to stop you right there. Uh, This is just how it goes here. And so it was that day that I researched master's of public health programs. And I ended up uh, going to Columbia for my master's of public health and focusing in sexuality and reproductive health. Uh, Started Sex Ed with DB in 2017, right after Trump got elected. That was kind of the part two of my motivation. And I've been doing this work ever since. Wow. That's an amazing, remarkable story. So, I mean, what kind of conversations around sex did you have then growing up with your your father being an Orthodox Jew and your mom being a gynecologist? Was it something that like they felt was very important to talk to you about? I would say my dad was more like conservative. Like he, he never like I don't think identified as orthodox, but he was, I would say, religious. He does keep kosher. Um, So there are some aspects of religion that he definitely keeps. Um, My parents are divorced also, so I didn't really grow up with him in the house since I was five years old. So it was really primarily my mom who I was having these kinds of conversations with. My dad, I had like maybe two different conversations with that I can remember as a teen. One, which was he was like, 
did you get your period yet? And I was like, yeah, I did. He's like, okay. And then one as a later teen, he was like, are you having sex? And I was like, yeah, I am. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> Talk to your mom about it. <laughs> like the classic dad thing. But my mom, like, even from a young age, when I first got my period at the age of 11, I was like struggling with the tampon. My mom like came right in the bathroom and like helped me put the tampon in. Like we were very physically and emotionally close from a very young age. Um, definitely a lot of conversations around like hooking up with boys and crushes and you know what what that was kind of like for sure. Like had kind of the the scare combo from her too of kind of like, hey, you know, like the STD, STDs, STIs are a real thing. Like you want to use protection. It's really important. And so uh, there were tons of different kinds of conversations that we had. So how did you feel that your mother's openness with you about sex education like helped you in your adolescent years? Did you feel that you were better informed than your peers were? And do you think that that made you maybe more responsible or like how did that affect you growing up? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think I got on birth control also from like a pretty young age pluses and minuses there. I think me, I personally had like a really hard time with the pill. And like, that is a lot of young women's first experience with birth control. I think it caused me to have a lot of stress and anxiety that I'm very glad that I don't have now that I'm off the pill. So, you know, I think like it, it's definitely there, there are some things that I was feeling like more advanced maybe than my peers and maybe more prepared, but at the same time, I, I do wish that there was emphasis on pleasure and an emphasis on uh, feeling good about my body. And, you know, I think like there definitely is like a generational gap there. Like my mom absolutely did not have access to those kinds of conversations when she was young. Her My grandma, her mom made her go to the library to check out a book on sexual health. And that was her only experience with it. So uh, definitely an improvement. But I think I am very much looking forward to the day when I have kids and hopefully I can really gas them up and be like, you're so awesome. Like you're, you know, you're going to have a great time. Like here are the risks and the rewards of having sex. Like people have sex because they want to and they want to have fun for a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I am excited to see how my future parenting skills pan out, although I'm sure it's going to be harder than I imagine. How, why do you think that there is so much shame and fear around the topic of sex, especially when it comes to women and sex? I definitely think that I would be remiss to not mention religion when it comes to fear, shame, and stigma. Um, America is one of the most religious countries in the world, despite us not necessarily thinking so, uh, with like the far right Christian propaganda that is embedded, unfortunately, in abstinence only education that is prominent in many, many schools across the US. That's where it starts, right? I think there are multiple ways that we learn about sex, uh, one of which is like sex in the media, one of which is from our parents or at home, and the other is really what are we learning in school. And so when we're really young and we're being taught right away, like, oh, we have to separate the boys and the girls for period conversations. Like, that's so embarrassing to get your period. You know, there are all these messages that we receive from school. And also parents just generally aren't really equipped to, you know, teach their young kids about their body and proper body parts and names. And, you know, same, same thing there when we're receiving the messages that, you shouldn't call your vulva your vulva and you should call it your hoo-ha or you should call your penis your pee-pee, right? Like these messages ignite a lot of shame and fear. Um, but as you mentioned, specifically, a lot of shame and fear for women and for people with vulvas. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned that thing about naming because that's, so I have a three-year-old daughter and, you know, I've, spoken to a lot of sex educators and there's a lot of conversation around like age appropriate um, conversations with children, which I definitely want to get into with you. But yeah, I mean, we're very like we call like her vagina vagina. I don't make up names for it. Um, but it's been kind of interesting to see like how my husband can be sort of uncomfortable around that stuff, I think, because because she's a girl and he doesn't really know. And um but I, I personally do feel like that's that's important because there's been like studies that have shown that that children who learn about their body parts without shame and who learn the appropriate names for it are like less likely to be targeted for like sexual assaults that's or right. molestation later on, right? Because they kind of understand 
these things. And I remember one thing that was really interesting was when I took her to the, my daughter to the gyneco gynecologist. Well, it was a pediatrician. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had to look at her vagina and the the pediatrician said to her and I thought this was really smart she said so I'm gonna you know take a look and it's okay because I'm a grown-up and mommy's in the room with me so mm -hmm. it's okay for me to do this and I was like that's actually like a good distinction to make like it's you're not alone it's not like a secret like there's a supervisor here that is trusted um I don't know I just kind of thought oh okay that's that's a smart thing to say so totally. I definitely want to talk about you and, and sex education with youth. Like, and this is something that parents really struggle with. How do you know what is the age appropriate conversation to have with your kids when? Yeah, I think this is a really common question. Um, the hosts of the puberty podcast um, are really, really wonderful and actually just wrote a book on this. I believe it's called This Is So Awkward or something like that. Uh, but I've I've chatted with them on my podcast and I've been on their podcast. And something that they say as uh, as parents and as experts in the field is like, whatever your kids are asking you, like you need to be prepared to figure out like, hey, what's the motivation behind what they're asking? And are they really wanting to know or is it something else that might be coming up for them? And what is the way that you can tell them the truth in a way that they will understand? And so I think like there's that piece, which is like when your kids are asking, that is a perfectly appropriate time to answer their questions. And if you don't know the answer, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, that's a really good question. I'm going to do some research and let's talk about this tomorrow because kids know when you're bullshitting them, right? Like they mm -hmm. know when something is off. And so depending on how old the kid is, usually, you know, if the kid is five years old and they're saying, where do babies come from, right? Do you need to launch into a 20 minute thing about the sperm and the egg? Like, Probably not. They might not understand that, right? But if they're in middle school and they're asking that, you can gauge whether or not your student or your kid is able to appropriately understand the information that you're giving them. But the answer to that question that I always have in terms of when is it appropriate to start having conversations with your kid is when they can talk. <laughs> like when they can, you know, basically like from zero to however old they are, right? Because there's always something that you can be saying, whether that be, here's the age appropriate, you know, thing that I'm going to talk about when it comes to the name of your nipple or your vulva or your penis, right? Like that is a conversation about anatomy, right? Whether they're four years old and a relative comes over and says something along the lines of, oh, I'm so sad because you're not giving me a hug, right? Like that's a perfect opportunity to say to your kid, like, hey, it's okay. Like if you want to set that boundary, that's your body and you're allowed to not hug that person, right? Like there are all sorts of kind of things. Um, another example for young kids is sharing, right? Like you may not think that sharing and friendship are conversations that happen in sex ed or in health education, but they totally are when we're talking about healthy relationships and again, how to set boundaries or how to be kind to other people. Um, or how to express your needs, like all of those things fall under the category of health education. And then of course, when we're moving along, when the, when, the, when the kid or the student gets older, we should be telling them information about themselves and their experiences before those things happen. So they're not so scary, right? So for example, if you have a, so a kid who identifies as a girl and they're going to get their period soon, right? Like seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, like that's an appropriate time to be like, hey, in like a year or two, you might get a period. And this is what a period is. And like half the world gets them and sometimes they suck and that's okay. And there are ways that we can, you know, manage it or whatever your your method is. Um, the last thing I want to say on this though, like tone and the way in which you go about talking to your kids is everything. Kids remember, right? And so when you are chatting with your kids, if you show that you're afraid and you're ashamed, they will totally pick that up. And that is the main thing that they will remember. So it's really important for parents to actually practice conversations, whether that be with their friends or with their partner, before they have them with their kid, if they feel like this is not their forte and they're not very good at it. Because being a sex positive parent and a supportive parent 
that's all the kid wants ultimately. If you don't know the answer to their questions, as long as you're supportive and you tell them like, hey, I love you no matter what and I'm going to get you the information and the resources that you need because you deserve that and you're a person who should be happy and healthy. So I think like the tone and like the context and the way that you talk to your kid is really important. Right. But I mean, do we do we need to wait for them to ask questions or is it important for us to think, say like, okay, you're five and now this, I should tell you something about this. Like I, 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 with other parents am a little bit, I don't know, like, do we wait for the questions? Or if we are sex positive parents who, you know, don't put shame around, you know, naming their genitals, like basic stuff that you're obviously, you're going to say those things to your kid when they're young because like you have to to wipe them there and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, will they feel free to ask you these questions or do you need to like get in front of something? You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. I think it depends. I mean, I think like anything below like seven years old, probably like realistically, your your kid's not going to retain like a lesson <laughs> that you, you yeah. sit them down and you give them. Right. Right. Um, but but I do think that that's why using their questions as a guide can maybe allow you to off the back of their question, create maybe another conversation. Um, mm -hmm. But you don't really know what exactly it is that they're going to want to ask. I mean, I think like a little bit later in adolescence, say like eight to 12 range, right? Like obviously you can talk to them about puberty. You can talk to them, hey, like there, let's talk about like what you might find on the internet because you might see porn and I want you to know the difference between real life sex and porn. Like those mm -hmm. conversations, you know, the average age that a, a boy in the US first sees pornography online is 11. So when we're thinking about that and we're, we're wanting to get ahead of it, you can really think, okay, maybe your kid is going to hate that you're talking to them about this and feel awkward. But at least they'll know that you're there for them and that you can help them. Hey, you're you're really too young to look at these images. It's not appropriate for you to view them. Uh, only people over 18 are really allowed to view them. But you might come across it. And if you do, I want you to just kind of like not look at it if you can because that's not actually realistic. And if kids can really hear that you are giving them, again, no bullshit, you're telling them the truth, um, then that kind of forms a uh, trust that they have in in the ability for them to come to you later and tell you things that you might want to know from them. Right, right. So if you're, say, like five and you're asking, sorry, I keep like rewinding just because I have a three-year-old. So I'm yeah. like my own personal selfish curiosity. Like if you have a kid who's five and they want to know where babies come from, I remember actually my parents gave me a book. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Where do I come from? I've heard of it, but I don't think I, I had it as a kid. So I remember like <laughs> reading this book over and over again when I was a kid. And I, I remember specifically what it said about sex because I didn't know anything about it and I was so curious. Um, and it said, and it was like, where do babies come from? And it said, babies come from when a man and a woman love each other and they snuggle up in bed and then they get closer and closer until the man is inside the woman and they just kind of like show this anatomy thing and then like this is called sex and this is how babies are made and then it had this whole section of like what does sex feel like and it said well sex feels nice it feels like being tickled by a feather but nicer and then the next question was well if sex feels so nice why don't people have it all the time and the answer was well sex is kind of like jumping rope it's really fun but you get tired after a while <laughs> and that just like was burned into my brain about like, okay, so that is, so that, I don't know, I guess that was my parents' way of, because I don't remember my parents ever sitting down and giving me the birds and the bees talk, which is kind of odd because they worked in the adult industry. But I remember that book really well. Do you feel like that was like a good way to explain sex to like a young kid? Um, I don't know if I would personally use those metaphors. I think that like, luckily, it sounds like that was a more positive way than many people learn about sex, which again, is like, mostly nothing people don't yeah. know, like how yeah. even today, right? Like we get DMs from people who are in their teens, but also I assume people in their 20s who into adulthood who ask all the time, like, am I pregnant? Like that is kind of like a key theme, like people don't know. And so I think 
what I would more so approach it as is like, you know, we want to be inclusive, right? We know that not all parents are a man and a woman. So that's right there. Yeah. I think what we would, what we would nix maybe. And maybe it's something as simple like, hey, inside someone with a penis's body, there's a thing called sperm. And inside someone with a uterus's body is called a uh, uterus and is called an egg. Um, and then you can kind of say like, in order to make a baby, the sperm meets the egg and that after 10 months or whatever you want to say, grows into a baby. And there are lots of different ways that people could have babies. They could have them from sex, which is a penis going inside of a vagina, you know, like, again, like very simple, like give them the yeah, actual clinical. definition, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, and you can say like, and people have sex sometimes because they like it and it's fun, but sometimes people have sex for a baby or some babies are, you know, like essentially if you want to say like, okay, here's, if someone wants to have a family um, and they can't have a baby, then maybe they can adopt a baby or they can maybe use a surrogate, which is someone else carries the baby. You know, you can like explain this to them. If they're five, they're probably not going to be interested in all of this, right? Yeah. But whatever they're soaking in, you know, the simple thing, a baby really comes from a sperm and an egg meeting and that grows into a baby. And like, mm -hmm. they don't really need to, and you know, the classic thing of like, oh, your baby's in your, in your stomach, it's in your belly. Well, it might look like that, but the baby actually grows in the uterus, right? Like there's really simple ways to just be factual about, and the uterus mm -hmm. does look like it's in the belly, right? You can show them a picture, like a very simple picture of like where the uterus is in the body. Um, mm -hmm. If more people did this, then less men would have zero fucking clue about women's bodies. And I wouldn't have so many videos come up on my feed that ask, hey, man, can a woman pee with a tampon in? And so many men are like, I don't think so. And that's because they literally don't know the difference between a urethra where urine comes out and a vagina where a tampon goes in. And so like <laughs> the more like real we are with our kids – without needing to feel like so much shame about just a biological thing that happens all the time, uh, the more prepared we will all be in adulthood. Right, right. Okay, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And then we come back, we're going to talk about the state of sex ed in the US, um, get a couple of tips, and so much more. So hang tight, we'll be right back. Okay, be honest, raise your hand. Who here went a little overboard with the holiday treats this year? Yes, yes, that was me. And now award season, AVN and Expos, of course, is just around the corner and I'm feeling the need to get my eating habits back on track. Now, if you're in the same boat, I have just the thing for both of us, Factor Meals. Now, I started using Factor Meals about a year ago and it's been a game changer. They deliver chef-prepared meals right to my door. We're talking delicious, balanced, and totally fuss-free. It's not just about losing those extra holiday pounds. It's also about feeling good, energized, and ready to take on anything, even awards night. I mean, how else am I going to have the strength to carry home all those trophies I'm going to win, right? Each meal is a perfect balance of taste and nutrition tailored to fit all kinds of dietary preferences. And the best part? No more spending hours on meal prep or guessing what's healthy. With Factor Meals, it's all about convenience and enjoying every bite. So if you're looking to reset your eating habits like I am, head to Factor Meals. Go to factormeals.com slash HRU50 and use code HRU50 to get 50% off. That's code HRU50 at factormeals.com slash HRU50 to get 50% off. Let's get our eating habits back on track. It's good for the both of us. Hi, everybody. We are back. So uh, we've talked about the dire state of sex education in the United States on this podcast quite a bit. Um, can you explain a little bit more about our situation with sex education in the United States and maybe if you know how it compares to other countries? Yeah, um, I mostly can really speak to the U.S. because that's really where my my work has centered in terms of my master's of public health. It was really U.S. based, uh, but we're definitely not doing well. I will say that uh, the stats that I'm about to read, a few of them are all from the Guttmacher Institute, which is a leading policy organization in the U.S. that does really great work and research around sexual health in the U.S., 
And so here are a couple of stats that I want you to be aware of. Um, Only 18 U.S. states require sexual health program content to be medically accurate. Only 20 U.S. states and D.C. require that information be provided on contraception. And 39 states and D.C. require that information be provided on abstinence. That's great. You want to give the the option, right? However, 29 states require that abstinence be stressed, right? So there's a difference between covering abstinence as a valid choice and stressing that abstinence is the correct or the better option, right? Um, Only 10 U.S. states and D.C. require inclusive content with regard to sexual orientation. And so hearing all of these, I assume you might be thinking, like, this is not great. (laughs) And the reason for that is because we don't have enough people who are passing these laws who have experience with comprehensive sexual health education, even though there is abundant an abundance of research that show that when young people have access to age-appropriate, comprehensive, medically accurate sex education in the places where that's the norm, the STI rate decreases, the unplanned pregnancy rate decreases, and the inverse is true. We know that where there's abstinence-only education being taught that STI rates skyrocket and unplanned pregnancy rates skyrocket. And so the research is there. Um, It's also inhumane. I think it's a human rights violation to only have access to abstinence only education, Um, especially when, you know, we hear the stat that only 18 states require program content to be medically accurate. Like what what are those teachers saying? Right. Like, yeah, that's going on there. That's what confounds me because. What so what what are they saying? Like what it like what are they telling kids if it's not medically accurate? Bad stuff, right? Like <laughs> teachers essentially would be able to say something along the lines of, "Hey, like if you uh, have sex before marriage, then you're you know uh, you're worthless, or if you have sex mm. before marriage." Um, that will cause infertility or cancer or, you know, things essentially or things around masturbation, right? Like there are so many myths that are so harmful around masturbation when masturbation is actually a really healthy practice for people and most people do it. So we might as well just give them the information that they need for them to for them to feel good about themselves and their bodies. And we don't do that, right? And so I think like it's extremely problematic, not only because lies are being told to young people, that's first and foremost the reason why it's problematic, but it's also problematic because these are very normal everyday things that kids should be able to learn about so that when they are ready eventually to have sex or to masturbate or whatever the case may be, um, that they feel prepared and not shamed for their actions. Yeah. Well, how do you feel about like those no fap communities and like the no nut November and this whole kind of movement for like against like anti masturbation? I'm not into it. I think that generally speaking, if people want to decide that they want to take a break from masturbation, that's their prerogative. I'm not somebody to tell somebody what they should or shouldn't do with their own body. But I think the root of that is kind of this idea of like, oh, well, I want to be more masculine and have more control over my sexual drive. And nobody cares. (laughs) Like, I just, I just feel like that's you like not masturbating for a month does not make you more masculine. It does not prove anything. Um, If you want to feel good in your body, you should not feel bad about doing that. You should not shame yourself. You should allow yourself to have that little bit of pleasure. Yeah. It's interesting because I often see it tied up with these whole like better yourselves memes, um, you know, make more money um, Instagram accounts. And it's it seems to just be where they're kind of just talking about lessening like your like these things that give you a lot of dopamine. Right. Which 
I think is fine if you, because look, we can all fall into those traps of watching too much Netflix, scrolling sure. on Instagram for too long. Like there's so many things that give us pleasure that we can totally overdo food, all of these things. But it seems like if that pleasure that we might be overdoing is, is masturbation or um, something sex related, that there's like so much shame associated with that, that it like, I don't know. I think that really fucks with people's heads. Yeah. I mean, yeah, totally agree. Like any habit could turn into an unhealthy habit, but masturbation, again, tied to religion where it's this idea of like, that's a sin. Don't touch yourself. Uh, I was watching. <laughs> yeah. It's just kind of like, okay, let him watch. I don't know what to tell you. Um, <laughs> it's just like, it needs to be more normalized. Like again, most people do it the more and more we pretend like people don't, then we're just doing a disservice to people and we're not allowing them to just feel good in their bodies for something that's actually healthy. Mm -hmm. um, what is the most common sex ed question that you tend to get? So yeah, we're hitting right, right on the topic. So the top two, I would say, is some form of the condom broke, am I pregnant? Or my penis was near her vagina and pre-cum was there, am I, is she pregnant? Like some form of that. Or like I'm masturbating too much, like how, what do I do about it? Or like I feel so guilty that I'm masturbating. And so luckily we've had these questions so many times that we've created resources where people can click on our Instagram. We have a highlight that says the top five sex questions that we get. And so if you're one of those people, I just kind of direct you to there because it's honestly too many people for me to like individually answer. But I think that goes back to the the foundation of people don't know their own bodies. Like they don't understand when ovulation happens. They don't know what a menstrual cycle is sometimes like that terminology. They don't understand that, you know, the pullout method is like 78% effective, right? So like maybe you're pregnant, like it's possible. Um, but I can't tell you that through the internet. So it's really important that people like go to their own community health professional and like take a test after they have first missed their period. Or if it's soon enough after, like take a plan B or take a prescription emergency contraception called Ella or use an IUD as emergency contraception. So, uh, and then if that fails, you know, understanding your options, if you don't want a pregnancy, uh, you know, what what do abortion options look like for you in your state, in your community? Um, so, yeah, those those two are probably the most the most common ones that we get. Mm. You recently conducted a very thorough masturbation experiment. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I would love to. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, essentially, one of my really awesome sponsors is the Magic Wand, a dream sponsor. And I kind of went to them being like, okay, what if I did like a full on study of me using the Magic Wand and tracking all of these variables, what would happen? And so my research question was, what is the impact of daily Magic Wand use on my health and wellness, as well as my sexual experience? when compared to regular sexual activity and no sexual activity. And so for consistency, I knew I needed to use a single method and I knew that a vibrator like the Magic Wand original would do the trick every time. And the experiment looked like this. Uh, it was a three week experiment where the first week was abstinence week. So no sexual activity at all by myself or with my partner. The second week was treatment week. Uh, I used the Magic Wand every day with or without my partner. And the third week was regular week. So regular sexual activity as normal with and without the magic wand, with and without my partner, like however I would typically have sex. And every day I, or, or masturbate. And every day during the experiment, I recorded measures on 27 variables, including stress, anxiety, productivity, mood, horniness, orgasm experience, and a lot more. And then at the end of the three weeks, uh, my team and I analyzed the results by noting changes in each variable over time. And then, yeah, so huge, huge study, uh, 21 days. Uh, every day I also did a vlog recording of like what exactly I was feeling. Um, I also in the article that I wrote talk about, okay, how is my period related to this and my horniness and my mood? Um, 
And so it was a, a really important feat, I think. There's there's not enough research, I think, definitely single subject research on masturbation. And I was, yeah, I was really surprised and excited about the key takeaways that we learned. What were your key takeaways? Would love, thank you so much for asking, would love to share. So uh, <laughs> when, so I have four key ones that I want to share. Okay. Uh, number one, when using the magic wand every day, I experienced less stress, anxiety, and physical tension. Number two, I reported more frequent positive moods when using the magic wand every day, including higher levels of confidence. Uh, number three, my orgasms, this is not really a surprise, but came faster and were more enjoyable when I use the magic wand every day. And surprisingly, my level of horniness increased over time when using the magic wand every day. For that last one, I kind of assumed like, oh, I'm like forcing myself to do this. I'm not going to be in the mood. I'm like making myself have an orgasm every day when I like have other shit to do or whatever. <laughs> and I actually like it kind of was like this self-fulfilling prophecy where I was like craving it more the more I did it. Mm. Um, so yeah, those those are like the top takeaways. But um, if you if you go to our website, sexedwithdb.com slash magic wand experiment, you can either listen to the full article or read the entire thing. And there's a ton of really great like bar graphs and uh, illustrations. And it was like a whole thing that I did. So I was, I was really, really excited to do it. Awesome. That sounds like, that sounds like uh, one of the more enjoyable experiments that it was one yeah. could do. <laughs> totally. Uh, I always like to talk about the financials of sex work or sex work adjacent industries. So how do you make a living full time as a sex educator? Totally. Yeah. So I actually talk all about this um, in a workshop that I put on called Building a Profitable Online Sexual Health Brand. <laughs> Very niche, uh, but for any sexual health people listening, um, I really we're, we're actually in the middle of a, the workshop series right now, the, a live version. But if you if you're if that sounds interesting to you, I'd, I'd love to chat um, because I also love this question. I love being able to share like, OK, this is how much I charge for social media advertisements or podcast ads or this is how much I would charge for, you know, going into a school and doing a workshop with kids or whatever. And so a majority of my income comes from uh, a package that I've created that is both for podcast ads, social media ads, giveaways, kind of like a couple other things. And I only work with a certain number of sponsors throughout the year so that I can kind of like max out working with them um, and and really be able to make my living uh, with a majority of that income from those ad sales. Um, some of my income also comes from things like this workshop that I do, consulting, making content for other brands, uh, teaching in the classroom, but I would say a majority of that income does come from advertisements. Well, Danielle, thank you so much for joining us. I know that I learned a lot. I'm sure my audience learned a lot today. Can you let everybody know where they can find you online and get more information? Of course. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure on my end to be here. Uh, if you like a little bit of what you heard today or a lot, you can check us out. We're Sex Ed with DB on all podcasting platforms. So Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to check us out on Insta, we have tons of giveaways, really cool content on there at Sex Ed with DB podcast and on TikTok at Sex Ed with DB. If you're a sexual health professional who's interested in learning more about how to make a living full-time doing this work, check out sexedwithdb.com slash workshop. And if you want to check out our brand new merch line, go to sexedwithdb.com slash merch. We have a lot of really cute hats, stickers, mugs, you name it. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for having me and hope to see you all there. Perfect. And you guys can find me on Instagram at Holly Randall and on Twitter or X at the same one. Um, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered to get access to these interviews early and also catch the live streams. Um, make sure that you give Danielle a follow and drop her a line, let her know that you found her here so she knows that um, it was time well spent. Thank you guys so much for joining us and I'll see you in the next one.